If everyone can get seated, we're going to get started in just a minute. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Sharon Matusik, the Dean of the Leeds School of Business at the University of Colorado Boulder. On behalf of Leeds and the University of Colorado, I'm thrilled to welcome you to the 57th Annual Colorado Business Economic Outlook. I hope as we look towards the new year together, we see continued signs of less uncertain times on the horizon. I know we all feel the ripple effects of the pandemic through continued economic uncertainty, ranging from supply chain disruptions to labor force constraints and new public health challenges that we all have to grapple with. That said, we at Leeds are very optimistic about what the future holds. The signs of recovery are everywhere on our campus, starting from students and our campus and corporate community back in campus en masse since this fall and all the great energy that comes along with that. It's especially terrific to see many of you joining us today here in person and many of you live streaming. We're very proud to be part of this vibrant economic community and are grateful for the many ways you have worked with us and with each other to continue our positive momentum in the face of many uncertainties. This afternoon, I'm going to share a few brief remarks from the Lead School perspective, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lead School Senior Economist and Associate Dean Rich Wabakin, who will present the outlook with the Colorado State demographer, Elizabeth Garner. They'll talk about how, while most of the states continue on the recovery path, Colorado's recovery is happening a bit faster than most. Our economy was outperforming the nation pre-COVID and is now continuing to do so in the recovery. At the LEAD School, we see ourselves as playing an important role in the success of our state economy. There we go. Um, we aim to inspire and educate the talent to fuel your firms into the future and create new insights through our research to help give you a competitive edge. And what makes LEAD special? We think it's our unique combination of academic excellence combined with access to this really amazing business community that you're all a part of. Our faculty join us from the best institutions around the globe. They're producing research that's published in the very top academic outlets, but is also being featured in publications like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, The Economist, and they're sharing these new insights with our students and with all of you uh, in terms of that uh, competitive edge we hope you get from their, their new knowledge. Um, but it's that academic excellence combined with access to this community that we think really makes the LEED School special. Many of you are among our corporate partners or engaged with us in many different ways, and it's that combination that really contributes to a strong academic experience for our students. And we see that throughout all, all sorts of different rankings on the national and global level, from US News and World Report's rankings, to Bloomberg, to Poets and Quants, which is one of the big rankings for graduate programs. So lots of great success as a combination of uh, bringing together that academic excellence and your connection to the LEAD School. We're especially proud of our students. They are really terrific. Uh, I thought you might enjoy seeing some of the statistics for incoming fall class of 21. Uh, this, for this most recent incoming class, we got over 11,000 applications for an incoming class of about 640. Now, we don't yield everyone that we admit, but really, really tremendous students. Their incoming GPA is a 3.87, uh, and our, our applications were up 35%. Over, um, over last year's cycle. And so even within that, we were really pleased to see about a 35% increase in applications from students of color and a 45, about 42% increase in our uh, female applications as well. On the graduate side, we've also seen really terrific growth. And I point this out because I think um, for many of you thinking about how do you retain your top talent, your high potential talent, uh, we've launched two new programs this year, our Executive MBA and our Hybrid MBA, which are aimed at providing the opportunity for people to advance their business education while they continue to work and move forward in their careers. And we've heard from many of you that this is a really attractive option for, those, for uh, the high potential talent in your organization that you're working very hard to retain. So lots of great ways to build out the skill set in your workforce um, through continuing education at the LEED School of Business. Um, I also wanted to just highlight the three initiatives that we're currently making a lot of progress on. One is our partnership with engineering, second, End the Gap, and third, our Career Impact Initiative. Here, as well as acro across the globe, 
to understand what you think is important in terms of business leadership in the future. This is a complement to those content knowledge skills of accounting, finance, marketing, and management. And so we've been working on making sure that we're delivering the right kinds of critical thinking skills, learning by doing skills, communication skills, collaboration skills that you are telling us are really important in terms of long-term career success. Uh, and what we're working on for the future, in addition to those initiatives that are driving our success right now, uh, one of the things that we're very focused on is making sure that we continue to have uh, lead school be accessible to those many applicants who uh, are interested in lead school education. So if you're qualified to get into the lead school of business, we want to make sure that you're not choosing another option because it's more affordable. So we're working very, very hard to raise the scholarship dollars to make sure that we're able to yield those best and brightest students who are interested in coming to the lead school. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of a sense of what's going on at the lead school. Our success is so closely to the, tied to the success of all of you in our business community, from those of you who recruit our students to those who work with us on research, speak in our classrooms, mentor our students, co-develop specialized programs. Your success is our success. With you, we're inspiring and educating the leaders of tomorrow, and we're really grateful for your support and your connection to us. And now, I hope you find this year's forecast helpful as you nav navigate what the future holds. The 2022 forecast will be presented by Dr. Richard Wabakin, our Lead School Senior Economist and Associate Dean of Business and Government Relations, and Elizabeth Garner, the Colorado State Demographer. Rich has been at the Lead School since 1985, teaching economics at Leeds and overseeing our business research division and our centers of excellence. Elizabeth has been directing the State Demography Office since 2004, regularly traveling the state to learn about and analyze the social and economic considerations that affect our future here in the great state of Colorado. Please join me in welcoming Rich and Elizabeth to the stage to present our 2022 forecast. Thank you for those uh, wonderful comments, uh, Dean Matusik. And thank you for coming today. You know, it's, um, it's been a rough year, two years for a lot of people, and we're really pleased to have people here with us today. We also have people streaming, we understand. Not everybody is comfortable or whatever, but I just wanna say thank you for coming. It's uh, great to be back. And so, uh, let me start by uh, moving along here and, and, and uh, thanking the steering committee. We appreciate the opportunity to share the information from our committees and are thankful for the support of the university, the LEED School, the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment, the State Demography Office, and our 130 committee members led by the 18 steering committee members you see on the screen. In this presentation, we will share our analysis and the voices directly conveyed by these 130 people that have written our booklet. The booklet, you've seen it on the way in. It is the largest one in history. If, if, not, if nothing else, it can hold down like any papers that are blowing away at 50 miles an hour. But seriously, we have a lot of people who focus very heavily on the book, actually read the book and, and don't see the live forecast. Uh, but rely heavily on the information in the booklet. And there is way more information, especially qualitative information in the booklet, than you're going to hear over the next uh, 60 minutes or so. So with that, I'd also like to take a moment to thank today's sponsors. Oh, oh. Oh, okay, now I got two. Today's sponsors include most notably B-Side Capital and the University of Colorado's Office of Outreach and Engagement, whose support is helping us share this information. So looking at the outlook, uh, demographics play an integral role in how communities develop and perform over time, and we're th absolutely thrilled to have the State Demography Office involved in presenting this forecast today. So a special thanks to Elizabeth it's great to be here with you, and we really appreciate the help of your office all year round, and I know people throughout the state do. So before we start, a round of applause for the state demographer. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. So as you see in this slide, we have left it up there for a couple of um, minutes to just give you sort of a sense. I mean, the, the short version of what I'm going to say in the next few minutes about the macro economy is we're pretty bullish overall on the macro economy. But there are so many things that create uncertainty as we go forward. Uh, you're going to hear about things like the supply chain issues and the, and the follow up session that's going to be right after this one. Certainly, there's concern about inflation, which appears to be getting to be more persistent than transitory, the employee shortage, and so on. So, there are lots of concerns out there. And we still don't understand, and, and the committee members reported this. Depending on the sector, we don't understand what the permanent changes are going to be from what the temporary changes are. I mean, are we going to be live streaming stuff, or are we going to be able to have full in-house events? I mean, you could just one small experience just from what we're doing here right now. So at the top of the list, of course, is the variants of COVID, and we have seen kind of a pretty big spike in Omicron and lately. This is weighing on both businesses and certainly on households. And so this is the, probably the biggest single thing that we've spent time focusing on in terms of how is that going to impact the economy in the year ahead, and especially re the recovery of certain sectors. So we look at U.S. real GDP growth, and when we look at that, this year we're going to come in and somewhere in the neighborhood of 5.5 percent. Next year, we're looking at 4 percent, so you would definitely call that bullish, and that's some of the strongest numbers we've seen since 2001. So we're really looking at two incredibly strong years in a row, and we've already surpassed the previous uh, peak in, uh, in GDP, and we see the economy on very strong footing going forward. Now, what's driving that? Well, number one, of course, continues to be the consumer. You can see from this graphic the components of income. And the components of income never really waned. You know, typically, we, we go into a recession, personal income drops. Why is personal income drop? People lose their jobs. But this time, there was such an amazing offset with transfer payments, which you can see in green, that we had this sort of surge in income even when people were getting laid off. And now, I would argue most notably, if you look at the upper right-hand quadrant in tan, you can see that employee wages or compensation are higher than they uh, have ever been. We're at a record-setting level of employee compensation at this point in time. So the good news here is, as we've seen waning, if you will, in the transfer payments and waning in uh, federal unemployment benefits, that has been offset by actual real work income, and the economy goes back to being more normal, if you will. This sort of relationship that I was just describing comes through a little bit differently if we look at this in terms of consumption and we look at savings uh, along with income. And you can see the massive drop off the blue line in consumption when we had March of 2020 and the nice recovery we've seen since. On the top tan line, you can see those spikes, which were the transfer payments, the, basically the federal rebate checks or the, the spikes that you see there. And down below, you see this incredible jump up in savings in the red line. And you see a couple of those when, when the transfer payments uh, occur or when the checks came in the mail. But now that is sort of waning a little bit too. So you're starting to get back to sort of more normal overall income based on wages, but also savings. So employment, what's happened here? Well, not this, as pretty a picture, but not a horrible picture. We've seen a recovery. And as of the Friday numbers, we're down less than uh, 4 million jobs. Uh, this is, you know, an area of concern over the long haul. Uh, we need workers. We have worker shortages in a lot of areas and in a very large number of states, including Colorado, the amount of available jobs as reported by the federal government in a report called JOLTS, Job Opening and Labor Turnover Survey, the number of jobs available is greater than the number of unemployed people. So we see that in the many places in the country, but certainly Colorado falls into that category as well, having a, an opening basically for everybody who's unemployed. So the jobs are there. They may not be the right fit or structurally different or may not be what the person is looking for, but we do have great availability of jobs. And much more importantly, I think if you look at this particular graphic for a moment, uh, you can see that this recession, while so incredibly severe, has really bounced back quickly. 
Uh, you're seeing that GDP is, is on a much shorter trajectory, uh, excuse me, employment is on a much shorter trajectory to get back to the same level, likely to happen in 2022, uh, latter part of 2022. So this would be you know, a short recession in terms of employment recovery, especially when compared to the 2001 recession and the 2008 recession, the so-called uh, recessions that were jobless. So when you're comparing this, you're comparing uh, an economy that was financially healthy this time. The banking system was in strong uh, shape. The households were in uh, good shape. The housing sector was not over leveraged going into this. And the bounce back has been much more rapid than, for example, the 2008, the great financial crisis. Employment growth, this, you know, this is year over year, so this might be a, look a little deceptive, but we're kind of in the middle here. You see Colorado in gray. Uh, we're not the highest growth states that are in the tan and the dark uh, brownish colors, but we're doing okay. Uh, and it's a little deceptive in the sense that if you look at a place like Nevada, the reason it's so dramatic year over year is as they reopen their gaming, they really geared up in the, more recently and have added more and more employees. Nonetheless, our, the state to the west of us, Utah, is, has more employment right now than they had going into the recession. Uh, they're in a very strong uh, place in terms of employment, so they're a very healthy economy. And in some context, a competitor, I've mentioned this in the past. So looking at the national unemployment rate, we can see at 4.2% uh, there. It is not at the same level or as low as it was in uh, uh, February of 2020. But it's getting there, it's going back down. You can see that it's approaching that. And there are many macro forecasts that are out there that are suggesting we're gonna to get to, back to those numbers in the third quarter or so of this year that we'll get back to essentially the full employment level in the economy. Also, uh, good news is that we had this tremendous impact on unemployment rates in varying categories that you see listed in front of you. These um, uh, unemployment impacts were a little uneven. You saw a greater impacts in some areas. But nonetheless, at this point in time, we're seeing that basically the unemployment rates are coming back to where they were going into the recession. So we have seen sort of a uniform recovery in the sense of going back to pre-COVID uh, unemployment rates. So what are we concerned about? Well, certainly confidence has been waning. Uh, consumer confidence, which relies a little bit more on employment on the left-hand graphic has been a little bit more positive, but consumer sentiment, which has a little bit more consumption uh, built into it and certainly has been seeing the impacts of higher inflation and higher interest rates, uh, consumer sentiment has really weakened quite a bit in, in recent weeks, so we're, or recent months actually. So we're really looking at this point and uh, looking at this and trying to determine is this going to really affect the consumer? Is the consumer really going to back off from consumption? Or are all those other positive things I described to you really going to uh, carry the day? Uh, we're leaning in that direction, but we're certainly paying a lot of attention to confidence. And we're also concerned about confidence at the small business level. We see a lot of uh, indexes that show uh, business confidence for bigger businesses is very strong. But when we go to small business, you can see from this graphic from the National Federation of Independent Business, the things like inflation, higher wages, worker shortage, all of those things and, and Delta uh, Omicron variants, all of those things are really impacting the NFIB Business Conditions Index for Small Business. Uh, closing, inflation, I've said it a couple of times, but I want to sort of just make sure um, uh, we, we sort of make a quick comment on this. It certainly has been strong. I think with the supply chain discussion we'll hear coming up, it will be very interesting to hear how you know, some of that part of the equation gets worked out. We do think there'll be some back off in terms of demand pressures on inflation. Uh, but how long this persists is certainly longer than the original transitory period that the Federal Reserve was talking about. And why this uh, is particularly of concern, other than paying more for everything, is that, of course, this will force the Fed's hand a little bit in terms of monetary policy. And again, that could have some effects in terms of macroeconomic uh, growth. So as I mentioned a couple of times, we are uh, going to be following this with a supply chain, insights into the supply chain at 2.10 or 2.15 when we conclude this forecast. 
and that'll be moderated by my friend and colleague, Greg Macaluso, and you can see the uh, unbelievable quality of speakers he was able to attract for the supply chain panel. So we're very much looking forward to that uh, supply chain keynote panel. So with that, we want to talk a little bit about co Colorado population, employment, and the economy. And going into this, you heard some of these numbers from Dean Matusik, so I won't belabor this too much, but we tend to look at Colorado's ranking every year. We try to be very objective about this in a lot of key uh, economic indicators. How are we performing in the one-year, three-year, five-year, and 10-year horizon? For a long time, uh, really since the recovery from this last recession, we have consistently and constantly been a top five to a top 10 economy. Um, more recently, we've sort of fallen out of that top 10 status. I personally do not believe the forecast we're presenting here today would put, keep us in a top 10 position, I think more like a top 15 kind of position, outperforming the nation, but a little bit uh, slower uh, than, than the, the very top states. And if you want a punchline on why that is, I, I think that's really related to the percentage of jobs we have in the services sector, and in particular, leisure, uh, hospitality, uh, you know, th that particular category. So with that, I'm passing the baton to the state demographer. Who better to talk about population than the state demographer? So Elizabeth, take it away. Super, thank you. Um, so population, the state demography office estimates that 2021 was the slowest population growth year for Colorado in three decades. This was driven not only by slow net domestic migration, but almost zero international migration and also from low natural increase from fewer births and more deaths. 2022 is projected to be the start of a rebound with increasing net migration driven by the aging of our labor force and demand for workers to fill job openings. However, natural increase is forecast to still remain low, lower than pre-pandemic levels. The state is projected to add about 61,000 people this next year. This is a growth rate about 1% in 2022 with about 93% of the population growth in metro areas. 19 non-metro counties are projected to lose population next year, continuing trends that we saw last decade. So after revisions to the data, we believe Colorado added about 87,600 jobs this year, or a growth of about 3.3%. Next year, Colorado is projected to add another 73,900 jobs, or 2.7%. The reasons for this projection are complex and will be discussed throughout this presentation. However, one theme appears consistent across all sectors. Worker shortages are creating headwinds. Despite the slower growth in 2022, this will put Colorado above pre-recession levels, a recovery one year faster than we anticipated last year. The good news, no industry is expected to lose jobs in 2022. The largest gainer, leisure and hospitality, our tourism sector, and professional and business services, our tech sector. While Colorado is recording higher unemployment rates than the nation, this is within, <clears throat> this is within the margin of error in the data. What bodes well for Colorado is we have the fourth highest labor force participation rate in the country. This should keep us primed for the recovery. The unemployment rate throughout this recession has been lowest in the rural agricultural corridors of the state. Now the lowest unemployment rates are extending to the rural resort areas of Colorado. Four of Colorado's metropolitan statistical areas remained in the top quartile for growth in October 2021. The Colorado Springs MSA grew 4.7% year over year in October, ranking at 53rd nationally. One of the first moves that people make when they lose their jobs is signing up for unemployment benefits. Colorado, like the nation, saw jobless claims spike to record levels during the early days of the pandemic. Unfortunately, fraud entered the system nationally and contributed to these elevated rates. In 2019, initial claims averaged 1,900 per week in Colorado. As of late November 2021, initial claims dropped to just over 1,600 per week, effectively dropping below pre-recession levels. 
the highest wage cohort, such as finance, tech, and mining, was comparatively less impacted by the recession and recovered above pre-recession levels in September 2021. The lowest wage cohort, which includes tourism and retail, took the brunt of the job losses, declining by 30%. While the recovery has been strong, this group of industries remained down 4.4% in Colorado in September. Construction. The construction sector has been surprisingly robust and stable in 2021, and it is expected that that environment will hold for 2022. There will be a changing emphasis among the subsectors with more production in residential projects and in infrastructure and relative decline in non-residential buildings. A common theme throughout this forecast is that construction material prices have experienced high inflation, but are moderating in late 2021. Contractors have created workarounds, absorbing significant portions of the increases, but they're looking to see higher prices being passed along to public and private owners and developers throughout the next year. Worker shortages also face the industry. As Colorado sees the conclusion of 2021, construction employment is still about 3,000 jobs short of pre-pandemic levels. The industry is projected to gain 1,300 jobs in 2021 and is expected to add another 4,000 jobs in 2022 to total 180,200. Residential building permits have recently returned to levels to supply the needs from annual population growth. Total building permits are projected to close out 2021 19% higher than in 2020, with extraordinary strength in both single-family and multifamily permits. Growth in single-family permits are projected to continue in 2022, but multifamily construction should be a bit softer, leading to similar levels of residential building in 2022 compared to 21. In 2021, Colorado ranked 12th nationally for home price growth, increasing 18.9% year-over-year in the third quarter. Three of Colorado's seven MSAs were in the top 100 MSAs nationally, and we're in the top half for home price growth. Pueblo was leading Colorado's MSA with 25% growth. Demand and material shortages are expected to keep prices elevated in 2022. The non-residential building sector tracks new, remodeled, and rehabilitated commercial and industrial projects, or institutional projects, offices and retail. Uncertainty around some types of space, such as office, led to a decrease in the value of non-residential construction in 2021. Activity is projected to rebound to $5 billion in 2022, but this is largely due to higher prices versus increased volume of activity. Non-building measures new construction and infrastructure projects, such as roads, bridges, and reservoirs. This value of non-building construction is estimated to total $2.8 billion in 2021 but should increase to 3.1 billion in 2022, with an increase in public funding for infrastructure at local level, state level from the Department of Transportation, and the federal level with the passage of the Infrastructure Investment and Job Act. Despite pandemic recession, the value of construction continued to surge 7.6% in 2020. Total valuation for residential, non-residential, and non-building will increase 7.1% in 2021, and 4.2% in 2022 to reach 22.9 billion, remaining below peak activity recorded in 2018. Colorado's agricultural sector made up just over 1% of Colorado's gross output in 2020. While every county records some agricultural activity, production is really generated in a few counties in Colorado. Two-thirds of farm income is concentrated in just five counties in this state, led by Weld County. A banner year for prices and demand is forecast for Colorado agriculture in 2022. However, this positive news will be countered by higher production costs and the prospect of drought, with the vast majority of the state experiencing moderate to extreme drought conditions. Calls on river water have been prevalent in the news as owners of senior water rights assert their legal right to a certain amount of water, which may lead to junior water rights owners not receiving all 
or even any of the water they would get in a year with more moisture available. This can lead to crops being unirrigated and dying or simply not being planted at all. Increased cash receipts are projected for livestock and crops in 2022. Colorado hay producers will benefit from higher prices for their hay, but ranchers and dairy farmers will pay more to buy that hay to feed their animals. Commodity prices have been highly volatile in 2020 and 2021. Higher prices benefit farmers and ranchers, but also lead to higher costs. Prices Colorado producers receive for wheat, corn, and cattle are up, but so are prices for fuel, natural gas, labor, trucking, and fertilizer. Gross value of production and farm revenue is projected to record record levels in Colorado in 2022. This, in part, is due to higher prices as well as to increase in real output. Net farm income is anticipated to decrease 2.5% in 2021, but should rebound slightly in 2022, increasing 10% to $1.25 billion. Manufacturing in Colorado was a $24.9 billion industry in 2020, representing about 6.5% of the state's nominal GDP and 5.5% of employment. Colorado's mix of manufacturing industries has contributed to the sector outperforming employment growth nationally. Some outperformers include food products, beverages, chemicals, plastics and rubber products, machinery and electrical equipment and appliances. Colorado's manufacturing sector is expected to average 146,900 employees, a 0.4% increase from 2020. However, growth in the sector is expected to accelerate in 2022 as exports rebound and supply chain issues begin to ease. Employment is expected to increase by 2,600 jobs and reach 149,500 employees remaining below the pre-pandemic peak. Non-durable goods include the production of goods that generally last for less than a year. This category continues to be a bright spot in Colorado's manufacturing, offsetting losses in durable goods subsector and fueled by steady growth in food manufacturers, a recovering beverage sector, and the increasing influence of cannabis manufacturing. However, positive growth in these subsectors was partially offset by contractions in printing. Non-durables account for 38% of manufacturing employment. In Colorado, modest growth of 1.7% is projected for 2022. Marijuana sales in 2020 totaled a record 2.2 billion, a 25.3% increase from 2019, according to the Colorado Department of Revenue Marijuana Enforcement Division. A closer look shows that this rate that recreational sales grew by 24% in 2020 and medical sales increased by 31%. Marijuana sales are continuing their strong gains in 2021 with total sales year to date in September up 6.6% over 2020 to 1.7 billion, signaling another record year. The other 62% of manufacturing employment is in the durable goods sector. Significant contractions in fabricated metals and machinery manufacturing offset gains that mainly came from computer and electronic products. By the end of 2022, the durable goods subsector are expected to be partially recovered with employment increasing by 1.8% or an addition of 1,600 jobs. Extended supply chain disruptions, labor shortages, and rising prices have continued to impact the durable goods subsector and represent significant downside risk. The natural resources and mining sector, while comprising less than 1% of Colorado's workforce, generates some of the highest per worker income levels in the state. With the COVID-19 pandemic's effects starting to wane and commodity prices, especially natural gas, eclipsing pre-pandemic levels, Colorado's 2021 natural resource and mining sector valuation has essentially recovered from the 2020 downturn. In the U.S. Energy Information Administration's most recent assessment of 2019 proved reserves, Colorado ranks seventh in the U.S. for both petroleum liquids and wet natural gas. 
For coal, the state was 10th in recoverable reserves and 13th in production in 2020. This same year, Colorado ranked 17th in total value of produced non-fuel minerals, according to the annual U.S. Geological Survey Mineral Commodity Report. Crude oil and natural gas are Colorado's two most valuable commodities. The U.S. Petroleum Benchmark, known as the West Texas Intermediate, closed 2020 at $48.35 per barrel. As of November 29th, WTI was trading at 69.88 per barrel, a 45% increase. The Henry Hub natural gas spot price was 236 per million BTUs at the close of 2020. You can see the price spike during the freeze that hit the deep south in February. The natural gas spot price in late November was $4.52, almost 100% higher. Colorado ranks fifth nationally in crude oil production and accounts for 3.5% of all U.S. output. Production in Colorado hit an all-time high in 2019 with nearly 193 million barrels. Oil production fell 11% in 2020 and an estimated 14% in 2021, but is expected to increase 8% in 2022. The value of oil output is projected to increase 22%, the product of higher prices and higher volume of production. Colorado ranks seventh in the nation for natural gas production, accounting for 5.5% of total output. More than one quarter of natural gas went to electric power and another quarter for residential use. Just under half of all U.S. households depend on natural gas as their primary heating fuel, compared to 70% for Colorado. Total value of production is expected to increase as the volume of production increases while prices remain flat. Colorado ranks 11th for coal production. Coal is competing with natural gas and renewable energy. The slated and government mandated closure or conversion to natural gas of electricity generated by coal-fired plants continues to lead to decreases in production nationally. The state's total coal production is expected to drop to 9.2 million tons by the end of 2022. Colorado's abundance of renewable energy resources includes wind, solar, hydroelectric, geothermal, and biomass. Data from the EIA show clean energy resources accounted for 30% of Colorado's net generation in 2020, a 5% increase from 2019, and a tripling since 2010. The natural resources and mining industry employed an estimated 19,900 workers in 2021, a loss of 9%. This is the lowest level of industry employment since 2005. In 2022, employment is anticipated to rebound slightly to 20,500. International trade. Uh, trade tracked the recovery boosted by the increased demand and consumption with national and state values experiencing their largest annual increases since the rebound from the Great Recession. Ex goods exports and imports in Colorado are likely to finish 2021 above their recent 2018 record values, while services stunted through quarter three of 2021 from a continued restrictions in international travel will likely, likely finish slightly below, even as quarter four 2021 is showing strong service export growth as these restrictions ease. Canada and Mexico remain Colorado's top export markets, accounting for 33% of the state's total exports. The strength of the U.S. dollar is generally trended upwards in 2021, with the real trade-weighted broader broad dollar index nearing the pre-pandemic highs of the late of late 2019. National exports were up 23% year-to-date through 27 through September of 2021. Despite higher national trade values, headwinds for international trade include surging demand, shipping misalignments, factory and port closures from COVID, and labor shortages. Colorado exports out underperformed compared to the nation, up only 12% year-to-date through September. 
This underperformance is partially due to Colorado's outperforming the nation in 2020. Colorado's top exports are usually skewed heavily toward meat, precision instruments, and aerospace. Colorado also has a stronger representation of electrical equipment, industrial machinery, articles of iron and steel, organic chemicals, photographic goods, and aluminum products compared to the nation. It should be noted that trade statistics at the state level quantify only goods, not the value of service exports. We begin the discussion of the services producing sectors by looking at trade, transportation, and utilities, the largest employment sector in the state. More than one in six Colorado workers are employed in TTU. The sector lost 9,100 jobs in 2020, or 1.9 percent, but added back an estimated 17,000 jobs in 2021, surpassing the pre-recession peak. Employment is expected to grow by 4,900 jobs in 2022 to 490,700. Colorado's wholesale sale trade sector employs over 111,000 workers, with most of those in durable goods. After losing 2,400 jobs in 2020, this sector is expected to gain 3,500 jobs in 2021, surpassing 2019 employment levels, then add another 1,400 in 2022. The retail sector accounts for $126.6 billion in sales in 2021, an increase of 16.6% year over year and 26.9% above 2019 levels. Consumers opened their wallets in the spring and summer with all retail sectors showing healthy growth this year. Inflation, though, has been a notable contributor to sales growth. Retail sales growth will continue in the year ahead due to households being in a very strong financial position. However, worker shortages, inflation, supply chain issues, and surging COVID cases could dampen consumer confidence and, in turn, retail sales. Current estimates have retail sales climbing 6% in 2022. Colorado's retail trade sector employs almost 270,000 workers, roughly 1 in 10 of Colorado's workforce. Consumer spending continues to surge throughout 2021, which fuels the retail trade sector, signaling optimism for employment. After falling by 3.9% in 2020, employment is projected to increase by 8,100 jobs in 2021 and an additional 2,700 in 2022, bringing employment levels back to 2019. The warehousing and storage sector has recorded tremendous growth, growing 135% since 2016. This growth is due to increased online shopping and the needed storage and distribution facilities for supply chain operations. Warehousing and storage employment increased 25.9% in 2020 and is expected to increase another 15% in 2021 and 18% in 2022. Another area of high growth is the couriers and messengers sector, which includes delivery entities such as FedEx and UPS. Also bolstered by increased online shopping, employment in the sector grew 28% in 2020 and is expected to grow another 12% in 2021 and 11% in 2022. The transportation and warehousing sector includes airlines, trucks, pipelines, and others. Colorado has a total of 14 commercial service airports, the largest of which is D DIA. In 2019, it was the fifth busiest airport in North America and the 16th busiest in the world. Passenger traffic at DIA fell 51% in 2020, but is rebounding well in 2021, with passenger traffic from January to September of this year up 74% over last year. However, this is still 18% below 2019 levels. Even so, DIA was the third busiest airport in the world through the first half of 2021. This is due in part to the relatively small portion of passenger traffic derived from international passengers at DIA, only 4.6% compared to other major airports. 
Colorado has maintained competitive electric and natural gas rates while becoming a nat national leader in clean energy and energy efficiency. Both electricity and natural gas consumption increased in 2021, boosted by cold weather and a rebounding economy. Natural gas and electricity rates increased with natural gas prices in 2021. Electricity prices have increased by 4% this year. Colorado electricity and natural gas consumption are projected to decline by about 2.5% in 2022. Companies in the information sector are responsible for the creation, distribution, and transmission of information. The information sector lost 2,100 jobs in 2020 as the pandemic affected operations for many businesses and long-run trends in digitization, autom automation, and consolidation continued. But employment is expected to rebound somewhat with a gain of 400 jobs in 2021 and 600 jobs in 2022. However, employment is, will remain below those 2019 levels. The publishing industry includes any firm that issues print or electronic copies of original works for which they own a copyright, like newspapers and books. Publishing overall is expected to have modest employment gains in 2021 and stay relatively flat in 2022. The newspaper publishing industry in Colorado continues to consolidate and migrate toward digital consumption, which was exacerbated in 2020 with the pandemic. Software publishing tells a different story relative to the rest of this sector and is looking to record its seventh straight year of growth in 2021. This industry includes business analytics, software, database software, and video games, among others. The industry recorded double-digit increases in establishments, with this past year being no different, and average industry wages in Colorado are more than twice the state average. Software publishers in Colorado range in size from small startups to major corporations, with offices in the states such as Cisco Systems, Google, Hitachi, IBM, and Oracle. Colorado has a high concentration of employment in the software industries, twice the national average, but Utah, Oregon, and Washington are significant competitors in the software publishing space. Over 26,000 people were employed in the telecom sector in 696 establishments throughout Colorado. Over 71% of the telecom employment is located in the Denver metro area. The telecommunications industry lost more than 500 jobs in 2020, continuing the employment decline seen in 2019. The pandemic has accentuated the need for robust communication infrastructure, with the demand for connectivity skyrocketing due to increased video calls and smart devices. Telecom sector employment is expected to remain the same in 2021, before adding 700 jobs in 2022 to get back to those 2019 levels. For the film, rounds out the information sector or discussion. Colorado has an incentive program that allows for performance-based rebate up to 20% for films, television, commercials, and video games produced in the state. Since inception in 2013, the film incentive program has paid over $21.4 million, had an economic impact in the state of over $270 million, and has supported almost 11,000 jobs across the state. Many notable films, television shows have been filmed in Colorado with the help from this incentive program. The state's video game industry has also benefited from the program with nine projects, including one of the top 10 highest selling games on Xbox in September of this year. The upcoming 2021-22 year has 7.25 million available in incentive funds, which will help Colorado to hire workers. The major segments of the financial activity sector include financial and equity markets, insurance, and real estate. The main story in this sector over the past years has been a large appreciation in most financial assets due to massive liquidity, from equities in real estate to cryptocurrency. In the year ahead, capital markets will be affected by inflation, low interest rates, monetary tightening by the Federal Reserve, and possible new COVID variants. At the end of November, the markets were at all-time highs, 
with the S&P 500 up 24 percent, the Dow 15 percent, and NASDAQ 22 percent. Each of these indices are up 20 to 70 percent from January 2020 levels. Markets have mostly been resilient since tumbling in mid-March 2020, driven by monetary and fiscal policy, but the Fed tapering could hinder gains. A zero interest rate policy was instituted in March 2020, sending rates to their lowest levels since the great financial crisis of 2008. However, elevated inflation has brought rate height expectations to the forefront in 2022. The Fed has indicated they will keep accommodative monetary policy until inflation has moderately exceeded 2% for some time. However, they have begun to taper bond purchases and the market expects the Fed to raise interest rates one to two times in 2022, starting around mid-year. The U.S. Treasury 10-year yield touched historic lows throughout 2020, bottoming out at 50.8 basis points in early August. Yields have since risen to 1.5% as of late November this year. Federal debt has increased by over $5 trillion since fiscal year 2019, and the U.S. federal budget deficit hit a record $3.1 trillion in fiscal year 2020 and was $2.8 trillion in fiscal year 2021. Banks entered the COVID pandemic with unprecedented strength in capital and liquidity levels, allowing them to assist customers and navigate 2020 smoothly. Deposits, which serve as a rough proxy for loans in Colorado banks, totaled $197 million, excuse me, billion, up over 14% this year. The current makeup of the 130 banks operating in Colorado consists of roughly 57% of deposits residing in the four largest banks, while the smallest 34 community banks collectively hold less than 1% of deposits. As part of the CARES Act, banks around the U.S. distributed nearly 11.8 million loans totaling almost $800 billion in Paycheck Protection Program funds from the U.S. Treasury and the Small Business Administration. Through October, 71% of all PPP loans have been fully or partially forgiven. Bankers excelled by making over 195,000 PPP loans in Colorado worth $15 billion in the first and second rounds of PPP. Loans were distributed by over 1,000 lenders to all 64 counties in the state with an average loan size of approximately $77,000. As illustrated in the table, the SBA has delivered more than $1 trillion nationally and over $20 billion in Colorado in economic relief from programs such as PPP, economic injury disaster loans, shuttered venue operators grants, and the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. Colorado's not-for-profit credit unions witnessed healthy loan growth and a large increase in deposits. Colorado's credit union membership continued to grow at remarkably fast rates. Through June 2021, year-over-year -year memberships grew 4.1%, following an increase of 3.7% last year. Credit union asset quality improved to hit a modern-day high this year. The over 60-day loan delinquency rate and the loan net charge-off rate also improved, sitting at modern-day lows, but they are expected to increase next year. Credit unions are expected to remain well capitalized in 2022. While the financial markets continue pivoting away from referencing inflationary pressures, such economic increases may not present all bad news for the insurance markets. In brief, insurers generate revenue through two simple avenues, underwriting profit and investment income. From an employment perspective, the insurance industry would outperform the overall U.S. economy throughout the pandemic. The insurance industry competes well for workers because of the higher than average pay and the ability to accommodate a remote work environment. Colorado continues to experience catastrophic claims at a rate higher than the national average. 
The East Troublesome and Cameron Peak fires of last year are estimated to have resulted in $620 million in insurable costs. The pandemic's effect on commercial real estate have been disproportionate with industrial experiencing remarkable strength and resiliency while office continues to struggle. Denver's office market continues to feel the impact of the pandemic and the slow return to the office for workers. The future use and demand for office space will continue to evolve as flexibility and a hybrid work model will be the norm, and an emphasis on wellness incorporating innovations in technology and design will be desired for office space. Absorption was down and office vacancies rose from 15% in Q3 2020 to 19.4% in Q3 2021 in the Denver metro area. Development activity marked the lowest pipeline since 2013. Denver's industrial market is primarily driven by distributors servicing a growing regional population, along with service and manufacturing businesses. The industrial market recorded its 46th consecutive quarter of positive net absorption in Q3 2021, which goes well beyond the six-year trend in the 1990s and reflects national industrial market trends. The projected annual absorption for 2021 will likely be a record high, driven by significant e-commerce and the switch from just-in-time supply chains to safety stock inventorying. Net absorption and delivery volume are both on track for the highest annual totals on record supported by strong build-to-suit activity and near-record leasing volume. Performance in Denver's retail sector was split. While the sector encompasses a number of businesses hit hard by the pandemic, such as enclosed malls, restaurants, and gyms, it also includes businesses that have shown strength, such as online retailers with grocery and pharmaceutical anchors. Total availability and direct vacancies continue to stabilize from the impacts of the pandemic, with availability at 8.8% in Metro Denver and Q3 2021, and vacancy at 7.3%, down slightly over last year. Q3 2021 marked the second consecutive quarter of positive net absorption, a welcoming sign after four straight quarters of negative net absorption. Improved fundamentals and an uptick in activity will help the retail sector continue to slowly recover. Turning to residential, strong demand for single family homes continues in Colorado, boosted by continued household in migration and individuals relocating to larger spaces and out of densely populated areas. The average price of a single family home in Denver is 582,000, appreciating 17% from 2020, primarily driven by near record low inventory levels. According to RE Colorado, home prices have appreciated all over the state, with Colorado Springs observing a 21% increase in September 2021. Silverthorne 39%, Winter Park 24%, and Grand Junction 10%. The month supply of inventory in Denver fell to one month from two, and the median days on the market dropped to five from 12. Overall, the statewide real estate market is expected to appreciate five to 10% in 2022 due to continued strong demand and lack of supply. After losing 2,200 jobs in 2020, financial activities employment is projected to increase by 5,300 workers in 2021, surpassing 2019 employment levels. Strong employment growth will continue in 2022 with a gain of 5,100 jobs. We will have a real estate breakout session immediately following our keynote panel. The session titled A Supply Chain Goldmine in Real Estate will discuss the hot residential and industrial markets, capital chasing investment opportunities, supply chain challenges for the construction industry, and the industry's shortage of workers. The professional and business service sector is composed of professional, scientific, and technical services, administrative and support and waste management services, and management of companies and enterprises. 
Unlike many sectors, professional and business services adapted quickly to pandemic restrictions, as many job functions in this sector proved relatively easy to convert to a work from home format. This is the second largest employment sector in the state, employing over 16% of the state's workforce. Colorado's high educational attainment is key to supporting employment growth within this industry. The state has the second highest percentage of bachelor's degrees in the nation at 42.7%. This is supported by the state's ability to educate young adults and recruit a highly educated workforce from other states. The proportion of people in Colorado, in Colorado with a science or engineering degree is the highest in the country at 39.1%. Key occupations in the professional scientific and technical services include attorneys, computer scientists, architects, engineers, and researchers. This is one of Colorado's strongest employment sectors and is on track to add 10,500 jobs, or 4.4% in, in 2021, after adding 3,000 jobs in 2020. Industry growth has been strong historically and is expected to continue into 2022, adding an additional 5,800 new jobs, or 2.3%. Appropriations for infrastructure expansion, which drive growth in the architecture and engineering subsector, are continuing with state appropriations for highways, roads, bridges, projects, focused on building and focused on building an electric vehicle infrastructure. The computer systems design subsector has seen 11 years of steady job gains, with an average employment growth of over 5% over the past nine years. Businesses within this subsector create software, design computer systems, integrate technologies, and manage computer systems, and rely on a highly educated and technically skilled workforce. Denver ranked 12th for the best market for tech talent in 2021, according to CBRE's annual Scoring Tech Talent Report, falling from 7th in 2020. Administrative and support and waste management and remediation services took a hit in 2020 due to the nature of the industry. This sector includes establishments that that perform routine support activities for operations of other organizations including employment services, cleaning, and waste disposal, among others. Employment services, which is typically an early indicator of future hiring trends, is fundamentally changing, as it's facing competition from different hiring channels. One bright spot in this sector is the services to buildings and dwellings, which has seen employment increases due to enhanced sanitary measures in office buildings stemming from COVID. The sector lost 11,800 jobs in 2020, but is expected to gain 5,500 workers in 2021 and an additional 1,600 workers in 2022, but will still remain below that 2019 employment level. After losing 8,700 jobs in 2020, the professional and business service sector is on track to gain 19,900 jobs in 2021, a gain of 4.6%. This sector is expected to add another 8,200 jobs, or 1.8% 1 in 2022. A disproportionate amount of job growth derives from startups and high growth ventures, highlighting the importance of small business to the state's economy. This is one of the topics that will be discussed at the Entrepreneurship, Startups, and Economic Drivers in Colorado breakout session hosting by the Deming Center of Entrepreneurship at 310 today in the Mount Sopris room downstairs. The leisure and hospitality super sector includes performing arts, entertainment, sports, recreation, accommodations, and food services used by Colorado residents, tourists, and business travelers. Leisure and hospitality accounts for more than one in every nine jobs in Colorado. The industry was heavily impacted by the pandemic and continues to face challenges, including COVID-related mandates, continued fear of the virus, worker shortages, and increased wages. After losing 73,300 jobs in 2020, the industry is expected to recoup 33,100 in 2021 and another 31,700 jobs in 2022. 
However, despite this rebound, employment will remain well below 2019 levels. Colorado welcomed 74.1 million travelers in 2020, down 14.7% from the record 86.9 million in 2019. Colorado tourists accounted for over 15.4 billion in total spend in 2020, down 36% from the 24.2 billion spent in 2019. Tourism spending isn't expected to return to 2019 levels until 2023 or 2024. Colorado's restaurant industry suffered from the most challenging environment in our lifetimes in 2020, losing $3 billion due to dining shutdowns, capacity restrictions, and other operational obstacles. Restaurants have adapted to state dining restrictions, including focusing on takeout and curbside pickup to go alcohol and outdoor dining. However, the industry still faces worker shortages, increased overhead costs, and the threat of additional COVID restrictions. Restaurant retail sales in Colorado looked to end 2021 higher than in 2019. A recovery of hotel performance has come with the reopening of business, removal of restrictions, resurgence in travel, and restoration of disposable income for tourism. Overall employment and accommodations and food services is expected to increase 12.3% in 2021 and 10.4% in 2022, but will still fall, fail to recoup the 58,100 58, jobs lost in 2020. As you can see here, retail sales for Colorado accommodation and food services have rebounded to well above 2019 levels, while Colorado's employment in the sector has yet to bounce back. This is even the case with a record amount of job openings in the U.S. for accommodations and food services positions. This is a story for much of the leisure and hospitality sector and highlights the labor market difficulties. Establishments are faced to deal with, with more sales volume and fewer staff. Much of the Colorado brand includes the varied use of public lands, which accounts for the majority of outdoor recreation. Colorado is projected to record over 71 million visits to Colorado state and national parks, BLM land, and national forests next year, a record high. Visitors to the state's national parks and monuments will total 7.6 million in 2022, of which almost 5 million will visit Rocky Mountain National Park. Despite the challenges of the pandemic, Colorado maintained its 33 casinos through proceeds, though proceeds declined by 67% in 2020. Adjusted gross proceeds in September this year to date are up 87% over the same period last year and up 14% compared to 2019. Over 1.1 billion was wagered on sports in 2020 and the state's water plan received $7.9 million this year from taxes. Colorado sports books took nearly $408.3 million in wagers, wagers in September 2021, a record monthly high. National snow sports visits increased to 59 million in 2020-2021, the fifth highest level on record and up from 50.1 million. In Colorado, the state's 31 ski areas recorded 12 million visits in winter 2020-2021, up from 10.8 million. The industry has benefited from a surge in interest in outdoor recreational activities, but still faces ongoing COVID-related operating challenges. For the upcoming season, on-slope capacity limits and social distancing restrictions that were implemented last winter are expected to be eased, along with a full loading of lifts, boating well for total ski visits. With the current drought and lack of snowfall, we are experiencing Colorado. The slopes are really hoping for some moisture. You don't want to hear me sing, but let's just say, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. <laughs> the education and health service sector includes private education services, as well as private sector health care and social assistance sectors. This sector represents roughly one in eight of Colorado jobs. 
More than 88% of this industry is made up of the health care and social assistance. Slightly more than 12% of this super sector is related to private education. The private education sector includes educational institutions that can be classified as private not-for-profit and private for-profit. Colorado has 78 private accredited colleges and 244 in-state occupational schools, down from 83 and 271 respectively last year. Losses include Ashford, American Sentinel, and University of the Rockies, and Johnson and Wales. Employment in the private education sector is driven by both business demand for continuing education programs and consumer demand for training that improves employment prospects or quality of life. Overall, private education employment gained 2,200 jobs in 2021 and is expected to recoup 1,200 jobs in 2022. Healthcare and social assistance employment was hit hard March and April, stemming from healthcare providers temporarily suspending non-emergency procedures due to the pandemic. This sector has recovered jobs since reopening, however. A continued struggle to contain the virus could create more volatility in employment in the months ahead. Health sector employment is estimated to increase by 2.8% in 2021 and 1.5% 1 in 2022. The rate of uninsured in Colorado has remained stable at about 6.6%. COVID-19 has caused a shift back to Medicaid markets with higher rates of unemployment. Between 2019 and 2021, the percent of the population receiving Medicaid coverage increased from 18% to 24.8%. From March 2020 to June 2021, Medicaid caseloads increased by almost 300,000 people, an increase of over 25%. The pandemic was hard on mental health, with 23.7% of Coloradans aged five and older reporting eight or more days of poor mental health in the past month, up 8.4 percentage points from 2019, according to the 2021 Colorado Health Access Survey. The education and health service sector is anticipated to add 10,400 jobs in 2021, an increase of 3.1%, fully recouping the jobs lost in 2020. In 2022, employment growth is expected to continue with an addition 5,900 jobs, or 1.7%. The other services sector includes repair and maintenance, personal laundry services, and nonprofit associations. Industry growth is influenced by the demographics of the population, disposable income, and consumer behavior. Many establishments in this sector are heavily dominated by face-to-face -face interactions, which had to close or limit service over the past year and are heavily susceptible to COVID mandates and spikes in cases. A few positives for the sector outlook include increasing donations will help nonprofits, union popularity and power could make a comeback as workers' rights are in the spotlight, car owners are holding on to their vehicles longer, increasing required maintenance, and people are visiting face-to-face -face businesses again. After declining by 8,500 jobs in 2020, the other services sector is expected to add 3,800 jobs in 2021, and another 3,300 jobs in 2022. However, employment will remain below 2019 levels. Federal, state, and local government is the second largest employer in Colorado, making up nearly one out of every six jobs in the state. Government activities range from space research and technology to public safety to program administration and education. Government employment fell by 14,100 jobs in 2020 and is expected to lose another 2,100 jobs in 2021. Employment growth will return in 2022 with an addition of 7,000 government employees. The federal government remains one of the state's largest employers providing 53,100 civilian jobs. Federal government employment is expected to decline to the end of Census 22, which bolstered employment by 
which bolstered employment growth in 2020. Colorado's federal government employment is projected to fall 2.7% in 2021, back to 2019 levels, but recoup some of those losses in 2022. Colorado's state government was heavily impacted by tight budgets in 2020, but additional federal support looks to maintain and strengthen state government employment over the next year. Spending cuts in 2020 were restored this year, and a larger 2022-23 budget is on the horizon. In addition, President Biden's $1 trillion infrastructure bill will pump $6.2 billion into Colorado state government to be used on infrastructure projects. The state government sector continues to see employment losses in 2021, stemming from a 3.6% decline in state education workforce. Excluding public higher education, state government employment is expected to increase 2.5% in both 2021 and 2022. Overall, state government is projected to fall by 2% in 2021 and then increase by 1% in 2022, remaining far below the 2019 employment levels. Local government employment is projected to grow by 0.7% to 261,700 in 2021, and is projected to grow another 1.8% in 2022. A Colorado Municipal League survey found that of the 173 municipalities that participated, 83% felt that CARES Act and ARPA funds met or ex exceeded their needs. Large municipalities in particular found that replacing lost revenue was only possible because of the federal, federal stimulus funds. Lack of affordable housing is the largest issue facing municipalities in 2022, followed by a tight labor market and unfunded street and road maintenance. Lack of affordable housing has led to an increase in the unhoused population in large municipalities with nearly three quarters of these municipalities report, reporting homelessness as a cause of concern. Colorado's public K-12 institutions, including charter schools, educate nearly 900,000 students every year. Due to the pandemic, schooling shifted to virtual and hybrid learning during the 2020-21 year with some districts seeing 25% of their families choosing to continue remote learning when the schools were fully opened. Interestingly, there was a dramatic shift back to traditional school setting in 2021-22, with that 25% of those students decreasing to 2% once regular routines were replaced. Kids at home, I, I don't get it. I don't understand why. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Overall, funding of education in Colorado compared to the national average has declined since 1992. Many school districts have turned to increasing local property taxes to support education, making the ability to generate revenues a function of property values and local voter support of public education. So summarizing, started the presentation uh, talking about 2021 and 2022. We anticipate our committee members that we are so grateful for estimate that the economy will gain 87,600 jobs this year and growth will continue into 2022 with the state projected to add an additional 73,900 jobs, a 2.7% increase and very importantly spanning all sectors of the economy. We do believe Colorado will continue to outperform the nation, but as I said earlier, we think the state will remain outside the top 10 based on this forecast, somewhere in the sort of top 15 range. Very importantly, I want to readdress the concepts of headwinds, tailwinds, and uncertainty, and not go through all of these with you, but just to highlight the fact that we certainly understand that there are some things we are relying on that are certainly strong, like retail sales and GDP growth, some things that are out there that are clearly headwinds to the kind of economic growth we're hoping for, supply chain, inflation, worker shortages, and then a whole set of unknowns. We don't know when the Fed policy is gonna happen. We don't know how work from home is going to work out, and so on. 
So we have things in the category that really make us, um, you know, certainly have pause and have sort of a, a boundary of error, if you will, or a confidence interval on our forecast for the coming year. We do believe strongly, based on the reports from the committees and from the think work that we do ourselves, that Colorado will remain a relatively competitive market in 2022 as we emerge from the recession, creating, retaining, and recruiting a highly talented workforce with assets ranging from our desirable quality of life to our diverse and robust economy. We continue to be a, a in-migration destination. So with that, I want to thank you for being here for the forecast. I want to give a special shout out to Elizabeth. Thank you so much for assisting today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Take care. And as I suggested, all of this information and a whole lot more is in your booklets. Uh, so if you're interested in a particular sector, please go directly there. So for the streamers that are out there, uh, we're going to be sh um, off streaming for the next hour or so while we have our supply chain panel, and then we're going to be back on streaming with the real estate uh, section. Uh, I, I'm smiling because, you know, I grew up at a time when there was a thing called streakers. Some of you probably know what that is. And every time someone says streamers, I think streakers. And so it's just kind of a... A weird part of being older, I guess, you know, if the thing. 